A major new series narrated by Bob Hoskins begins now on BBC One as some of the most notorious villains of the last 50 years reveal the chilling reality of the underworld. blow a safe. With a life of crime behind him, he certainly did not earn this life of ease, nor does he particularly enjoy it. He hankers after the excitement of his youth. You never get rid of them and you, and you never retire because your mind and your brain are attuned. I think the instinct is always there. When you're blowing a safe, you think, Christ, you know, are you going to strike a bonanza or strike nothing? Sometimes you blow bl nothing in them. Another time you'd open and say, oh, Christ, look at this lot. You know, the, the feeling was tremendous. This is no retirement cruise, the Isle of Wight Ferry. To villains like Frankie Fraser, it's a passage to Parco's prison. He's made that trip many times. Inside or out, Fraser was one of the most violent and ungovernable criminals of his generation. Well, I'm known as Mad Frank, or Mad Frankie, only because I've been certified insane, twice in prison and once in the army. Mad Frankie has spent more than half his life in prison or Borstal. He served time in every top security prison in the country, and in 1969 led the Parkers riot. He prides himself on never having won even a day's remission for good behaviour. I'm nearly 70 years of age. I've spent over 40 years in prison. That would be for smashing grab braids, armed robberies, grievous bodily arm, wounding, assault, breaking and, en break and entering, receiving and stealing cars. <laughs> Frank Fraser's first glimpse of the underworld was as a boy at the races in the 1930s. Gangsters who dominated the racetracks ran protection rackets and forced the bookmakers to pay up. The front man, who collected the money, went round cleaning the bookies' blackboards. He had a use for a young, willing helper. Well, I just had a bucket of water, and I went along with a man who had a sponge. He'd bend down, put the sponge in the bucket, and wipe the board clean for the bookmaker. Really, they no needed the guy with a sponge and me with a the water. They could have done it themselves quite easily. It was an early lesson for Frank of the power of violence. If the bookie wanted to keep his pitch, he had to pay for a service he didn't need. If he didn't allow this, he knew then other people would come along and say, look, you can't be there, and up on your bike, go and go. And if he didn't, he'd get a clump for his uh, troubles. <laughs> At the end of the day, I would sometimes get seven and six. Tremendous amount of money <clears throat> for an eight-year, nine-year-old boy. Knowing full well as my father, going to work at four in the morning, not getting home till seven at night, and winding up even then with about 50 bob a week. So I thought to myself, well, this is the game to be in. Poor but honest background was also Eddie Chapman's lot. He came from the northeast and lost his shipyard apprenticeship in the depression of the early 30s. He ran away and joined the Coldstream Guards at 17, lying about his age. 
The army took him to London, where he decided the bright lights of the West End were more attractive than his uniform. He deserted and was imprisoned and then dishonorably discharged. Society had shamed him, but the underworld welcomed him. In prison, he took up with a thief or scroogeman called Jimmy Hunt. He taught him how to steal. He took me out on my first serious screwing job. We did a Fife's banana factory. So I just followed him in, broke into the office, and there was a small safe. And he showed me how to rip the back off. He said, these are, oh, he said, tin back, yeah, fine. He got a, just got a screwdriver, dug it in. Then he, he put a box opener in, pulled it back, and the, the river went crack. And he worked right along the top and cut the back out in a matter of minutes. Behind there was asbestos. The, pulled the asbestos on the floor. And just a tin box built in. He, he ripped the tin box and it was two or three hundred pounds in. And uh, I thought, God, <laughs> this is fantastic. A good thief could rip the back off a safe or Peter in six minutes or less. Security was minimal. Society wasn't geared up for dishonesty in those days. Like big stores like Woolworths, they had the big glass front stores, which they still got today. And the safe would be just on the left-hand side as you looked in, all lit up. Everyone could see it. Well, really, it was an open invitation. All anybody done, they went in the back way. As soon as it was clear, you just well, put the the wheels under it, you know, tr or trolley, and wheeled it out as if it was yours, which it was. Then you'd have to knock it open, take it to somewhere, someone's house, or to a garage, where obviously you had the tools to help to knock it open, which was quite simple. The pre-war London underworld was a close-knit community that seemed almost innocent compared to its counterpart across the Atlantic. There were relatively few career criminals and they followed a certain code. Eddie Chapman and Jimmy Hunt found the approach of a young American totally unacceptable, but he did give them an idea. We all used to use a club in Soho, like, it was a thieves club, and everybody used it. There was an American that in, uh, had arrived there, and he'd been operational in America. And what he was trying to do was to get somebody to help him to do a hoist, a hold-up. And he was walking about with a bloody gun on him. And he was introduced to Jimmy and I. So we said, no, you know, we never carry guns. I mean, the law didn't carry guns, and there was a written rule. I didn't know anybody who did. Jimmy certainly didn't, I didn't. And um, Jimmy said, I know what's going to happen to that bastard. He, He's going to finish up doing a lot of time. And then he said, don't you blow Peters over here? Blow them? No, you know, we ripped the backs off them. Oh, he said, you ought to get some jelly. He said, blow them. So he described roughly what, what you did. The pair set off for the quarries of South Wales. The public were about to have a rude awakening. At that time, explosives had to be stored in clearly marked sheds 400 yards from the nearest building. We uh, jammed the door off, and it was full of gelignite, detonators, um, and we took two packages of gelignite, uh, 400 detonators, and some fuse. Tried it on a tree, and the whole bloody tree came down. <laughs> And Jim said, Christ, it'll do that to the tree, it'll do it to the safe. And we did the underground at um, Edgeway Road. Broke into the office, the safe was there, and we just pushed it in the keyhole, sealed it off with chewing gum to hold it. I gave it plenty, and the whole bloody door fell off. And there was 
quite a lot of money. And uh, I said, Christ, this is great. We then started. I mean, every week we were knocking something out. They started the Jellignard squad. The papers got hold of it. Every time there was a job, it was on BBC. On the eve of the war, Eddie and the Jelly Gang were running from the police. He fled to Jersey, hoping to escape to France. Eddie had the crook's instinct for self-preservation and was more worried by the prospect of 20 years in Dartmoor than by the fate of Europe. Conscription was introduced four months before war was declared. For most members of the underworld, the priority was to stay out of uniform. Defying authority in all its forms was central to the criminal self-respect. Those who would not be called up were rounded up. Many were prepared to use any means to get out of the army. In the guard room, there was all old pals of mine, and they were all acting mad in some way or other. I thought, oh, blimey, got to do something exceptional here. On a Saturday night, they got me there. So the doctor wasn't on till Monday, everything closed down at the weekend. So Monday morning, they handcuffed us over to the doctor. And I dived straight over his desk through the window, giving him a right hander on the way. They brought the psychiatrist in to see us. And I uh, kept just looking over my shoulder. He said, what are you doing that for? I said, oh, well, and I think I know someone at the back of me or something. Anything that come in my head. Oh, he said, oh. And uh, the next day they had an ambulance and carted us straight off to North Friday Mental Hospital. Man, Frankie, that was the beginning. Frankie Fraser quickly escaped from the mental hospital and disappeared into the underworld of war-torn London. Most aspects of life in the Blitz that so annoyed average Londoners were heaven-sent opportunities for the criminal. It really was wonderful. Go to the West End in your car, take the back seats out, nick the car. And we had an ARP helmet on with ARP on and an armband. Smashed the windows in with the car. I had food control, keep out of the way, please. And people were helping us to load it up. And you go out on a woman's dress shop, back of Regent Street somewhere. Good gear. Smash the window. It's all blackout, wasn't it? And that. And uh, if an air raid siren was going, better still. It opened up a new world. Theory that the Second World War was a watershed in relation to crime and the consequences of crime on society. And the reason is the introduction of rationing regulations. Many people who found, found themselves for the first time tempted to break the law. Even the housewife was prepared from time to time uh, to break the law. Now, everyone was crooked. Because the mum, she'd want to buy extra eggs for her children and a bit of extra meat. Because everything was rationed, food from... So she'd be willing to buy anything. Everyone was involved. And what, it was wonderful. What did that make thieves in the eyes of people? Loved you. You supplied the uh, man with the extra cigarettes, didn't you? Sugar. Anything. Clothes, petrol coupons, clothing coupons. It was a thieves' paradise, and everybody was a thief. Eddie Chapman was a thief whose luck seemed to have run out. His flight from British justice ended in a Jersey prison after he broke into a safe. He was still inside when the Germans invaded the island in 1942. The Germans bombed the island to start with, or let a few bombs loose. And then they ordered the Jersey populace to put white flags everywhere. And they simply occupied. There was no resistance at all. Eddie Chapman volunteered to spy for the Germans for money. His plan was to become a double agent for MI5 in return for all charges against him being dropped. The Germans thought anyone facing 20 years in a British jail would be an ideal recruit and trained him as a saboteur. 
In early 1943, Eddie was parachuted into Britain to blow up the factory making the de Havilland Mosquito. It was the only Allied plane raiding Berlin at that time, and the Nazis wanted the factory destroyed. But on arrival in Britain, Eddie turned himself in to MI5 and helped them to fake the destruction of the Mosquito factory. To keep Eddie's cover, the British made sure the Germans believed he had carried out his mission. And they allowed a German reconnaissance machine to come in and photograph the blaze. They then flew in at the same height and photographed it all. They, they then came to me and they said, look, this is to set your mind at rest. I said, here are the photographs. The Germans will think that this sabotage has been done. And what the, the, they then called all the backroom boys together. And somehow they delayed the times all of the places. There were 9,000 bombs dropped on London, flying bombs. So you can imagine the damage. But we succeeded, in the short time we were doing them, in shifting them over the top. So that uh, what they didn't want was the centre of London, you know, the House of Parliament thing destroyed. They didn't mind the provinces being knocked around, but they didn't want the centre of London uh, interfered with. Chapman's role in diverting the German rockets was important enough to persuade the authorities to give him a clean slate. And he got money from the Germans too. His wartime gamble had paid off. Just being pulled out to challenge on the far side. Sinner's reprieve on the stand side makes headway... With Eric Mason is one of the post-war generation of British thieves. ...and Alco, Brocktune Gold in the red on the stand side here. Time star and attack. They've got just over a furlong to go and stone back to the Mason's criminal form is mainly for robbery. The Cray twins admired his reputation. He was one of the first to use guns in the early 60s and did 10 years for armed robbery. His apprenticeship in the underworld involved a type of crime that's nearly as old as the motor car itself. Nowadays they call it ram raiding. It was just as popular in the 40s. Then the targets were jewellers and the crime was known as smash and grab. The teams, they wouldn't need a lot of getting together. There were so many, everybody that we knew were a, was a villain in some respect or other. If you had a certain window that somebody had looked at and said that it was, you know, there's plenty of stuff in the window, easy to get. But the only work you had to do then was go and find a fast car. We'd break the window down on a lower part of the, make a hole in the window, and then put, put your hand through with a cane and knock it out from inside, knock the window out. The, the jeweller shop windows weren't like they are today with the unbreakable glass. In every jeweller shop window just fell, up, fell apart as soon as you hit it. Operating in packs was becoming more popular among thieves but there was still a place for the lone wolf. Jules Tater's Chatham was a one-man crime wave. Safe blower, country house raider, cat burglar. He even broke into the jewel room at the Victoria and Albert Museum. In 1948, he stole two ceremonial swords given to the Duke of Wellington, a priceless national treasure. They were inlaid with gold and over 200 diamonds and other precious stones. The market value of the stones and gold alone were put at £10,000, the equivalent of 200000 today. I saw these swords and realised what they were, what they were worth. And uh, I was so tempted by them that I was sort of besotted by them. I thought, oh, I've got to have them. The only way I could get in was through a window about 40 feet up, which had been damaged during the war and hadn't been repaired. Came downstairs into the main uh, passageway and I could hear security people. The Wellington collection was in one big room. I got to the case where the 
swords were and I could hear crockery chinking or well, must have been a, a, either a restroom or the cafeteria for the security people I could hear them talking and that anyway I smashed the glass took the swords and was away a massive hunt was launched to find the swords questions were asked in Parliament about the security of national treasures the swords were never recovered and the thief never found. In fact, Jules Chatham sold the gold and fenced the jewels over the next nine months. I never regretted taking it, although I suppose I should have done. Because although I, I'm a, been a, shall we say, been a bit of a villain, I've still got a certain respect for you know, for such things as national heritage and things like that. Eddie Chapman ended the war with a clean record, but he couldn't resist the lure of safe breaking. The trouble was, the safe makers had caught up with him. An explosion would now jam the door rather than open it. Sometimes you can get away with it by bringing in a very big crowbar because the front would be open and you could pull. I took Chatham with me. I, I, I had one open. I could actually see the money. And I, the crowbar I had was about that length. It wouldn't touch it. So I came out to Hammersmith Broadway. Chatham was he'd been to a club. He was standing alone. And I said, George, I've got a Peter half open. I said, what I want is a one of those big builders bars, you know, the very long ones. And we went around and we found a, a, a really big one. And he and I went back and we tugged and we heaped and couldn't touch it. And dawn was coming and the milkman would have been on duty, so we had to leave it. We were doing safes which probably realised a few hundred pound. Lucky, perhaps a thousand pound or more which uh, didn't last long because I was a gambler and Eddie being a playboy like the clubs and the young ladies the money soon ran out. By the mid 50s the robber had started to take over from the lone safe blur as the big money earner in the underworld. Violence was proving an easier route to the money than stealth and skill. Elaborate security measures were not yet common in banks. Bank messengers were an easy target. They carried large sums of money from one branch to another, virtually unguarded. But quite a lot of banks just hired a private car and it was simple. But not that simple in a way because people was encouraged then to have a go. So you had to be prepared for uh, some resistance and that and you just smash into them stop them and drag them out might have to give one or two of them up with your cosh sometimes the private car owner or firm because they didn't call them mini cabs and be a private car hire he could be uh, in it with you. In fact, he would tell you about it, and he always used to say, always take my ignition key when you stop me. So that way I can't chase after you after you've gone. But of course, I always made sure he wouldn't be in a fit state to chase us anyway. And uh, not only took his ignition key, took some of his blood and all. I don't say that amusingly, that was for his benefit as well. Because when he was in hospital, being stitched up, and he would be interviewed by the police, and the police would instinctively think that he was involved. But when they'd see the state of him, they'd hold back a bit, thinking, oh no, no, he couldn't be.
Career criminals study the sentences meted out to fellow villains like a gambler studies form. The stakes are high and the odds vary. As one particular crime becomes popular, so the sentences get heavier. The professional criminal stays ahead of the law by not sticking to the same crime for too long. That's why Eric Mason moved on from smash and grab to theft from lorries, known in the underworld as the jump up. Going from smash and grabs to store breaking and the jump up was, uh, was a natural progression for people. In those days, a smash-and-grab raider seemed to be a more glamorous type of character and, they, and the judges would deem it necessary to, to give them a severe sentence to discourage other people from doing it. Whereas the jump-up, the punishments were less and the money was pretty good because you could always sell cigarettes and, the, uh, and all the jump-up people did was follow the wagons that used to deliver the tobacco to cigarette shops and elsewhere. They invariably put the, the delivery amount on the back towel board of the lorry and take maybe one or two cartons in and as he delivered them, you, you as a team would rush, get the other four cartons, throw them into your car and drive off with them which would net you something in the region of 100 quid a time. Uh, in the 40s and early 50s, 100 quid uh, a day was very good money. It was brilliant, considering the average man's wages would be about 20 quid a week. We started then thinking about, we, we had the fences to sell the gear to, so why not get uh, the wagons like most of the bigger criminals were doing and that was hijacking wagon loads and consequently we'd get millions of fags instead of thousands and, and, and naturally then we'd be into the big money that was when we started buying the big fast cars and and doing all the things that the natural uh, the, the progression took us to uh, the things we were looking for the good life Teams of robbers started to look elsewhere for ready cash as the money travelling from bank to bank became better protected. The payroll was the next obvious target. Callous violence was now routine. Nobody ever told you about the robbery, you found it yourself. So there was no danger of it being leaked out. So all one had to do where there were quite big firms, look for the nearest bank, and then on Friday, just go into the bank, and if you see two or three people getting a chunk of dough, you then wait for them to come out. They not normally walk to the firm, which might only be a hundred yards away, or two hundred, they'd walk it, about three of them. And the next week, you'd watch him again, if you had any brains, anyway. And then the third week, you was there, prepared, and you'd uh, just give him a couple with your coshes and pinch the bags and into your car and away. It was as simple as that. Our ploy used to be a, a starting handle. Cut. And you put some rubber, fit it into some rubber, to really not make it too severe. Once you hit them with that, they were out of the game. I know it sounds wicked and, and spiteful and that, but, uh, you know, that's how, how it was. Judicial practice was to punish violence with violence. The robber who used a kosh could expect a flogging with the birch or cat of nine tails. Prison was extremely harsh. Prisoners could be kept on a bread and water diet for up to 14 days, sometimes with no mattress in an unheated cell. But sentences were relatively short. In my early days at the bar, the standard sentence for robbery with violence in the streets was 12 months imprisonment and 12 strokes of the cat. 
And I remember Lord Goddard saying he thought in a way that was a more merciful sentence than the present practice of giving them four to five years. Flogging was still a punishment for violence against prison staff until 1968. Although it was abolished as a court sentence 20 years earlier, both Frank Fraser and Eric Mason got the cat for assaulting prison officers. After being taken back to the cell, a guy who was in the punishment block who had been flogged before told me through the window that it was obvious that I was going to have corporal punishment. And he said to me that, that you are no what you're going to get. If they take your strides down when you come in the day before your punishment, uh, it means you're going to get the birch. But if they just look at you, take your shirt off and look at your back, you're going to have the cat and nine tails. Former judge Sir Frederick Lawton's knowledge of the prison system is extensive. His father was governor of Wandsworth Prison and supervised scores of floggings. The Home Office will not allow the prison cat of nine tails to be filmed. It's still an official secret but it was copied from this one used by the Navy in the 19th century. My father was of the opinion that the cat was uh, unnecessarily brutal. It did uh, a good deal of damage to the offender, and towards the end of his service as a prison governor, when he had to arrange floggings, he had greater and greater difficulty in finding an officer who was prepared to do it. Well, this machine here, this was the official corporal punishment for the cat and for the birch. Looking at it now, it brings back memories, awful memories, because after all, I've been strapped onto this machine, and I've at this punishment, also the birch. Well, your ankles would go in there, strapped. Then your wrists would go in here. That would be a bit higher up, of course. And your head would go in there, right in, and force that in, so that, effectively, you wouldn't see anyone then. You didn't know who'd give you the cat at any time because you couldn't look behind you and whoever did give you the cat, when you come into the room which in Wandsworth, in the case of Wandsworth, for most prisons by the way you always had the cat in the laundry you were rushed in and you hardly see anyone anyway because in no time he was up and then it was the governor's turn then Francis Davidson Fraser you have been sentenced to 18 strokes of corporal punishment. In your case, the cat. And the governor would then say, stroke one. And you'd hear, whoosh, bosh. Again, whoosh, bosh. And what it done when it hit you, it knocked all the air out of you. It, like, all the air, but the sheer fat on the back. I received 12 strokes, and uh, it was each each stroke seemed to go in the same exactly the same place, and it got progressively uh, more severe as it went on. Later, after being taken from the frame and taken to the cell, um, it, it then become a deep throbbing pain and the blood was seeping all over the place from down I, they had, one of the strokes had cut my chest open I still have the scars to this day I was just left in the cell to my own devices and I could hear the, my spile being lifted and the sniggering of the screws and I realised then it, that the, the hatred that overtook me then was never going to leave me. The underworld is impressed by men who fight and defy the prison authorities. A classic but relatively rare way of doing this is to escape. In May 1954, Jules Tater's Chatham for once was breaking out instead of breaking in. 
with a fellow inmate, Tate has escaped from Brixton while awaiting trial. I escaped from Brixton with keys to open the gates leading out of the wing so I could walk round to another gate in the compound, through the compound, up the scaffolding of the building which led on to the, the perimeter wall, over the wall, and that was it. Amazingly, only two keys were necessary to walk out of the prison. One for the door on the wing and another to give access to the prison yard. George Chatham bribed a prison officer to help him. And I promised the officer, I said, you, if you go and see my wife, she'll give you a piece of cuttlefish. You bring it in and let me take the impressions and take it back to her and she'll give you £300. I took the impressions, he took it back to my wife, she got the keys cut, he brought it back in, with a, she gave him another £300 to bring it back into me, he tried the key, made sure it worked, which it did, gave me the key, and I said to him, if it's successful, he'll give you another £400, that's like a £1,000 altogether. Anyway, the, that was it on the Saturday morning. Well, we're gone, went. Chatham was on the run for 21 days. After he was recaptured, he was sentenced to 10 years for a series of major burglaries. The targets were chosen from Lloyd's insurance ledgers, which he'd gained access to. These books were like a checkbook because in these books was listed the companies, private persons, all insured, say jewellery, what the jewellery consisted of, where it was kept, what sort of protection there was, whether it was burglar alarms or, or safes. In fact, it listed everything that a burglar would give his right hand to know. When Chatham came out of prison in the early 60s, he teamed up with a younger man who was becoming infamous as a burglar. Their exploits together were the basis of a feature film. They were never caught for any of the scores of jobs they did together. Chatham's partner in crime was Belfast-born Peter Scott. He specialised in jewel thefts. Even on his first country house raid, he had a certain sense of style. I actually bought a suit of charcoms to go and rob my betters. I felt that I had to be adequately dressed. And uh, when we arrived there, it was pissing down with rain. And uh, the butler was laying this majestic table laden with food and silverware. I felt a bit like a missionary, seeing my flock for the first time. I realised this was my life's work, persecuting the rich and the opulent. Peter Scott achieved the kind of fame in the underworld that his victims enjoyed in straight society. He was one of the last of the generation of thieves who crept over Mayfair rooftops. He was eventually put out of business by increasingly sophisticated security systems. I gave the fur trade the, fur trade the benefit of my degeneracy for a great number of years and well, then I got into 
little bit of surf blowing and a little bit of running about with my propane burner. How did they get into the safe? Well, as you can see, they've burnt a hole uh, into the safe door and opened the locks. This safe had approximately £25,000 worth of jewellery. And it was all in this safe? Everything was in here, yes. I suppose I can say in all modesty that I've probably, um, probably removed from about 20 to 25 million from Mayfair. Goodness gracious. How audacious. Goodness gracious. How flirtatious. Goodness gracious. It is me. It is you. <laughs> I'm sorry, it is us. Ah. In early 1960, while filming in England, Sophie Loren was robbed of £185,000 worth of jewellery. It was the equivalent of £2 million today. The thief was never caught. It was a big um, ruby necklace mm -hmm. and a sapphire necklace with sapphire earrings and sapphire ring with mm -hmm. diamonds. And uh, there was this emeralds uh, necklace with diamond earrings uh, and a diamond ring. and. Uh, this one, uh, three striped pearls. Memory does pull, but I think I probably did steal her gems. And, uh... There was a great deal of publicity. She was coming to England to make a, a movie, and, uh... It was a very interesting snippet, another in the mail of the Telegraph, Hickey or Tanfield in those years. And, and every time she made a film, uh, she was rewarded with a suite of jewellery. And uh, that whet my appetite. And there was another little snippet. She was staying at a Norwegian barn in Elstree. Peter Scott travelled to Elstree to size up the house the studio had provided for Sophie Loren and her film producer husband, Carlo Ponti. I found it, and uh, I'm observing what's going on in the house. It doesn't appear to be any staff. Ponti had just come back. They had left a ground floor window open. Uh, they were down in the sunken lounge embracing, uh, uh, nothing, just embracing, and I crept through the window, and as I crossed the hall, I was in their line of vision. They didn't look up, up the stairs, and they made the second mistake. They had this tall boy with this enormous hasp and padlock on it, which almost read, the jewels are here. You couldn't do anything with a padlock, but it was infinitely simple just to jemmy the top of the tall boy off, which I did with this huge blanket from the bed over my head and uh, well there it was this magnificent uh, uh, cache of jewels in a very large briefcase and so she was deprived the jewels were never recovered this audacious theft took place as underworld attitudes towards the establishment were changing Nothing was off limits anymore. Going to work, as we called it, going to work, you didn't wear, you, know, you didn't do a post office, you didn't do a bank, you didn't do those kind of, they were kind of the establishment. The criminal, from my early days, always was anti-weapons. They didn't, it was a, a thing that was a natural, you don't use guns. In the early 60s, the barriers started coming down and you would go and do anything then. With the increasing violence of the robber came the routine use of guns. The 1961 amnesty on illegal weapons looked impressive but made no impact on the professional criminal. I started robbing banks when it was easy before the bayonet glass went to the top of the roof. We would appear into the bank, masked men with shotguns, and we'd fire a shot into the roof. Anything that was there was, I would take. I had no f feelings any way whatsoever that I was taking somebody else's money that wasn't mine. For robber and burglar alike, the odds were shortening. With growing public concern over the use of violence and guns, Long sentences were increasingly becoming the norm. Those thieves who were well past the first flush of youth started to feel the stakes were too high. 
The outlook for Peter Scott has changed a lot since his days as a high society jewel thief. He would rather live free and poor than risk ten years in jail. My final saviour was Islington Council. I've got a council flat. I've no money. Of course, as you can see, I return my arrogance. I am not, like some of my confederates, I am not reformed. I just have no more time to offer them. I have no more time, no more of my life to give them behind bars, so I stopped. George Chatham has stolen several fortunes and gambled them all away. He has only succeeded in enriching the bookmakers. What have I got now? A lot of sad memories, that's all. <laughs> Certainly haven't seen any substantial sums of money tucked away. No. Nothing's worth losing your liberty. But there you are, you, it's, uh, it's a gamble, you know what you're doing, you know the consequences, and uh, that's it. So if things go wrong, you've got to face up to it. In 1963, a seven-year prison sentence ended without remission. Frank Fraser emerged to find the underworld was ready for a man who would stop at nothing. The age of the British gangster had arrived.